creature cannot digest the egg. It just sits inside of it. What happens is a person gets this water, drinks the water, drinks it with the microscopic snail inside with the worm egg inside of it. Now, once that hits the stomach acid, of course, the stomach acid is going to destroy that little microscopic organism. And it would destroy the egg, but it's not in the stomach long enough. So now, uh, that water and the uh, destroyed snail, but uh, intact egg, move into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. That's where the egg hatches. This uh, worm starts to make its way through the intestinal wall into the lymphatic system. It goes south, or at least intends to go south, tries to go south, because it wants to get to some place like the foot. As it burrows towards the surface, uh, it has, creates an immune response. That immune response will be seen as a blister forms there. Of course, the blister is going to pop, break open, the skin is going to give way. And that will leave a little bit of a hole, a bit of an opening. So the next time this person walks down into the water, their foot goes in water, that tells the uh, worm it's time to release eggs. So he sticks his butt out and releases more eggs into the water, and the cycle starts again. Brilliant. Fact. Because if a person just drinks the water with just the eggs in it, the eggs wouldn't be destroyed by the stomach acid. So part of the life cycle depends on the eggs being ingested by these microscopic little cephalopods, microscopic little uh, snail-like creatures. Pretty brilliant. Now the thing is, these uh, worms can grow to be up to about a meter in length, literally up the leg. Try to just get it out, just yank it like if it was in a state like this, it could break, and then you end up with a broken dead worm inside. That's, that's not really a good idea. So um, the thing is, this this worm, Dracophonus metanensis, the guinea worm, he predates uh, really written history. It's been around a long time, and the people who were around this uh, parasite learned that if they wanted to get it out, uh, what they would have to do, or what somebody would have to do, they'd have to specialize in removing this parasite. Uh, the person would get their extremity, their foot, for instance, in this picture, put it in water, have the worm come out a little bit, go stick, and wrap the worm around a stick. But not completely, just, just a little bit. Not too much, because it would break. And then they would wrap, you know, tie the stick to the legs, say, come back tomorrow, Next day or a couple days later, they come back, put their water, they put their foot back in water again, and that would loosen the worm up and they'd twist a little more, they'd twist a little more. This was the treatment for, for hundreds of years, thousands of years. And in fact, uh, people who became <coughs> specialists in removing the guinea worm would often put some sort of an indication, like a plaque with a carving on, the, on that plaque to indicate that they were a specialist at removing this worm. And it would be a plaque with a carved stick with a worm wrapped around it, which eventually took on this shape. Now, initially, um, a lot of people think that, you know, the staff that we see in medicine that you see on your shirts is the uh, Staph vesculapius, right? The one staff with a snake around it. And of course, the caduceus is really uh, U.S. Army Medical Corps. But it's believed that's where this actually originated because the Staph vesculapius uh, isn't as old as this is. So this has been around for a long time. Uh, they they were supposed to have eradicated it back in 2000, 1999-2000. And one of the people who was leading uh, the, the charge on eradicating the guinea worm was actually former President Jimmy Carter. Uh, and they thought it had been eradicated, although apparently there are still cases that show up on, on occasion. Now, in recent years, of course, they would have to surgically remove it. It would give uh, some sort of anti-parasitic, uh, surgically remove them. But um, there's also, if you look on the internet, there is a drive uh, to
who saved the guinea worm. You know, like we try and save an endangered species. <coughs> a little unusual. But this is a really cool parasite. Imagine that this is a worm that intentionally releases its eggs into water, hoping that they get ingested as part of the life cycle. It's brilliant. Pretty smart for a worm. Besides the blister, what other symptoms does it have? Pain. A lot of uh, the inflammatory response is going to create some edema as well. Um, some of the things you can see, not so much with this, but since it still uh, involves a lymphatic system, you can still see elephantiasis. Uh, the, the parasite that usually causes that is called Pacheria bancrofti, but uh, you can see it with this as well. Elephantiasis, do you know what this is? Elephantiasis. This is when the uh, something in the lymphatic system, the lymphatic drainage is blocked, and the fluid uh, that should be circulating in the blood does not, so it leaks out of the blood and collects in the tissue. You've seen this before where the ankles are really swollen, the feet are really swollen. And in, in the extreme case of elephantiasis, I mean the whole leg is just one giant shape straight down. And it is elephantiasis, not elephantitis as people will call it, elephantitis is inflammation of the elephant, so that is certainly not correct. <laughs> but this is always a uh, fun parasite. How do you take it out nowadays? Surgically. Take yeah. a big old. Big old. I'm sure there would be some sort of pulling and yanking on it. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I will ever see this. Uh, if, if I come across this, I think with a patient, I would have to call somebody and say, look, I got this worm, and they'd say, you got a stick? <laughs> One of the test questions asked about an osteoma, right? Osteoma is a what? Bone tumor is benign or is it malignant? Here's a, a good thing to remember. When you're comparing um, benign and malignant, you'll often see on the end of the words an oma versus a sarcoma. If you see an oma versus a sarcoma, the oma is usually the benign version, the sarcoma is usually the malignant version. Malignant, of course, means it spreads. So it's just a good hint. Oma is benign. Sarcoma is malignant. Here's a. This is a big malignant tumor. It's a serous ovarian tumor. Um, yeah, this is bad news. This is a young lady. She was in her early 20s. Small build, but I mean, that's a big abdomen. She looked like she was about 20 weeks pregnant. And I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people thought she was. But she was not. Let's see. Let's see it there. Let's see. That's actually drained a, a great deal of fluid out of it. I think that's good. There. People think I'm delivering a baby in this picture. That's a tumor. It's pretty big. Uh, bad news. This is why we actually took the pictures. Uh, when we first saw this in ultrasound, it looked uh, like it was mostly fluid. So the first incision was uh, drain the fluid out, realized it was more solid. Increased the size of the incision quite a bit. Uh, so then we said, okay, now we need to really document this. And uh, I told the, the nurse to go grab a camera. The camera she found didn't have any batteries to it, so she got my camera out of my locker and my uh, the anesthesiologist happened to be a buddy of mine taking the pictures, but that's why there's a couple of me thrown in there. <laughs> so if you guys want a nice Christmas card, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Took out surrounding lymph nodes. All bad news. This was not the result of drugs. This was not the result of alcohol. This was not the result of viral infection that we know of. 
This is not the result of drinking. This is not the result of being a bad person. This is something that just happens. And that was a young, young age. Didn't they expect it? How many people have a background in chemistry? Yes? Um, any background at all? High school? College. College. Uh, college, uh, probably much better. High school, probably much worse. Uh, you probably had a teacher in high school who made you memorize the periodic table of the elements or, or something ridiculous. Which is a waste of time because you can see right there, I can pull up a slide of the periodic table of the elements. It gives all of the atomic weight, of the atomic number, atomic mass, and uh, even what the abbreviations stand for. There are some that you're definitely going to have to know. You're going to have to recognize things like carbon, and you're going to have to recognize things like oxygen, you're going to have to recognize things like hydrogen. But um, a lot of them you obviously you won't use in medicine. All right, well, we're going to go into a little bit of chemistry. Biochemistry, of course, meaning stuff that has to do with life. Everything is uh, divided into one of two categories, pretty much. Everything that we know of goes into one of two categories, either something that is living or something that is non-living. There is criteria uh, that must be met to put it into the living category. There is criteria that must be met to put it into the non-living category. I said the one thing that really doesn't fall into either category is, of course, viruses. viruses. Whatever, pretty much everything else can. An element is the smallest unit that remains in unique chemical properties of that type of matter. This is what you see when we talk about the periodic table of the elements. Usually abbreviated with a couple of letters, not necessarily the first two. Um, the example that you hear, of course, in the book uh, is natrium, Na for uh, natrium. But that is, of course, it's Latin for sodium. CL. You'll often see them with their uh, typical charge and they dissociate. Uh, so sodium is a positive charge, chlorine is a negative charge, and they go together nicely. In fact, wherever, wherever sodium goes, chloride follows. And this is true in biochemistry. This is true in, in medicine. So anytime salt is moving into a cell, you're going to expect chloride to want to move into a cell. Salt goes into a space, chloride goes into a space. Salt goes from one tissue to another tissue. Chloride goes from one tissue to another tissue. And then we have something that follows salt, and that is water. You'll see that in a little bit. Two or more elements joined together is a molecule. So we have sodium and chloride. We have a molecule of sodium chloride. Uh, but you can also have oxygen and oxygen and have a molecule of oxygen. It doesn't have to be two separate things. The smallest recognizable unit of an element is called an atom. The atom of sodium, the atom of chloride, the atom of oxygen. Atoms have a nucleus. In that nucleus, we find positively charged particles. 
neutral particles. The positively charged particles are, of course, the protons. The neutral are the neutrons. And then around on the outside, well, not always on the outside, flying around in a space around the nucleus, but also even sometimes through the nucleus, are the negatively charged electrons. Now these things are small. You can't see these. These are smaller than uh, viruses by another three zeros at least. These are very, very small particles. But even then they have some mass to them. And even though you hear these particles, proton, proton, protons, not a particle, just made that one up. Protons, this is why I don't want to be on this test. Protons, <laughs> neutrons, and electrons. You, s you hear these things, they all sound very similar. One's a positive charge, one's a negative charge, what's really the difference? Uh, here's the difference between the size of a proton, which is very, very small, and the size of an electron, which is very, 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 very small. Uh, if a proton was the size of the Empire State Building, an electron would be the size of a football flying around the Empire State Building. That's a huge difference. But again, this is something that's on, on an unimaginable scale. For me, it's unimaginable. I think most people can't really imagine how small these particles really are. Because we can, we can realize you know, how big an inch is, and half an inch, and then half and half an inch, and then half and half and half an inch. How big a millimeter is, and then half a millimeter, and then half of that, and then half of that, and then half of that. At a certain point, it gets to where we can't really imagine it. We don't have anything to reference it to. So, I hope this gives you a little bit of an idea when we talk about protons and electrons. You can understand the size difference. Electrons constantly moving unzipping in space around, surrounding the nucleus. Nice little um, table of the elements. I liked it because one of the things it includes is copper. You know, people realize that you have iron in your body because you've heard of things like iron deficiency, and you've heard of things like people getting enough iron in their diet. But you don't often think of some of these other metals. And the copper is one of them that is very important in the electron transport chain and uh, the creation of energy. So I like that uh, they have it here so that you realize that it, it does come up. However, it's not something that commonly is deficient, a patient is deficient in. However, there is a disease where a patient has too much of it. And that, just like they have too much iron, there's a disease for that too. Um, for copper, it's Wilson's disease. For iron, it's hemochromatosis. Have you heard of this? Hemochromatosis? You may have heard of that one. You might not have heard of Wilson's disease. Yes? What do you diagnose if you look at the eye and the way my stroke is stable? The little ring? Yes. Yes. Kaiser Fleischer rings, something like that they're called. Yes. Good. You've heard of this. Iron Fe, copper Cu. Both of those have positive particle charges. Zinc, Zn, manganese, not magnesium. Magnesium is not the abbreviation for magnesium. You will need to know this one. Mg, magnesium. Good tocolytic. Um, iodine, I, very important. We get our iodine in our diet from where? Where? Iron. Well, yeah, we can get there's some from some plants. We can find it in the soil. Uh, but in our salt, you ever see the container of salt, the iodized salt? We add it intentionally to our salt. And the reason for that is so that our thyroids don't become overact overactive, producing goiters. That's the number one cause of goiters in the world, is lack of iodine in the diet. So we add it to the salt. This is important to remember, because when you go to the store and you're thinking, I'm running out of salt at home, I need to buy salt, 
you're tempted to get that very special organic sea salt. Not the El Cheapo bag of salt on the floor. Alcan salt. Container of salt. Here's the thing about that. People think they're eating healthy when they see that organic, they see that um, they see that it's sea salt. Sea salt must be better. Why? It comes from the sea. Makes perfect sense. Well, first of all, where does the other salt come from? I mean, if it doesn't come from the sea, where does it come from? It comes from the ground. We mine it, right? How did it get in the ground? Used to, used to be a sea. Water left. Salt stayed behind. Technically, so sea salt. And then a lot of the sea salt does not have the iodine added to it. So you're actually doing a disservice to yourself by using sea salt in a lot of cases. Uh, but people, you know, like they get a little bit of information. They like to think that it's healthier. It really isn't. Use the use the iodized salt instead for a reason. It's all good for you. Oh, absolutely, salt is good for you. We need salt. Without salt, we wouldn't exist. We need water. Without water, we wouldn't exist. Too much water, we drown. We don't exist. Right? So, very similar. Oxygen is good for us. We need oxygen. Our body uses oxygen. Uses it to make energy. We can also make specialized chemicals to kill pathogens. Our body does that already. Pretty smart. That's how we get rid of the pathogens that are in us right now. The ones that are trying to invade. And our body says, no, we got you. Because we have special acids, poisons, uh, like Lysol, that will kill these bacteria, kill these pathogens. It's also dangerous to our own cells. We can make too much of it. That can create a problem. Or if we could not have the ability to uh, neutralize it, that could be a problem. Uh, fluorine, if we add fluoride. As I was on uh, nutrition, and the, the things that you should eat, understand organic foods have been around for a long time. They're not new. They've been around since at least the 40s. Uh, the term organic is actually a chemical term. It comes from chemistry. Uh, organic chemistry, for instance, is any chemistry that involves carbon atoms. So that's where the term organic actually originated from. You know, the fact that, well, it's a living thing. But the reality is, uh, organic foods are no better for you than other foods. Uh, people like to think that if they pay more money at Trader Joe's or someplace like that, I didn't say Trader Joe's, I meant some <laughs> other store. Because Trader Joe's is a wonderful store, and people should go there and shop buy things. But in some of those other stores, <laughs> you will find that they charge more money for these organic products. And there have been uh, tests over the past 70 years on organic products versus non-organic non products. And uh, they found the same thing. The only thing that organic products do is take more money out of your wallet. That's it. They're no better, they're no worse. Uh, the concern, of course, is pesticides. So if you want to you wash your fruits and vegetables, anyway, I'm sure everybody in here washes their fruits and washes their vegetables. I'm sure nobody in here washes their bananas. Why? Because you're going to peel it, right? But when you peel it, as soon as you touch it, whatever was on that peel is now on your fingertips. Sometimes you see people do this and break part of that banana off, which means whatever is on the peel is now on their fingertips and now on the banana. Or they eat the banana like that and then grab a strawberry like this. So you're really supposed to wash all that stuff. If you don't believe me, think about this. You know how I like for you to think, to think about. Uh, have you heard of something called night soil? Night soil used to be used in places like Mexico on the strawberries, for instance. Uh, they would apply it at night because it smelled so bad. And it was actually human waste. But it made a great fertilizer. And they would, sorry. <laughs> they would, I should use the chocolate donut. <laughs> it would be sprayed all over the strawberries. Great fertilizer. 
as long as you cling to the strawberries, you were probably going to be okay. Uh, but otherwise, you could look at things like hepatitis, right? So think about that the next time you're eating a banana. What was on that banana? What was it fertilized with? Um, what was it rinsed down, sprayed with? What was in transport? Who touched it? What did they touch before they touched it? Was it a kid? <laughs> And just because somebody says that uh, something's all natural since we're on this, it's got me on this already. No, I didn't mean to get into this conversation, but I want to work now. <laughs> just because somebody says something's all natural doesn't mean it's good for you, right? When I say about cow manure, cow manure is all natural. It comes directly from the cow. doesn't mean you want to put it in your body. Ebola, all natural, doesn't mean it's good for you. So... We can see here uh, a couple of um, elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Notice hydrogen is something that you're going to have to get to know very, very well. We see in the center of hydrogen there is a proton, and that is it. Uh, we see circling the hydrogen there is an equal number of electrons. There's one proton, so there's one electron. This is important to realize. Because if that hydrogen atom gives up that electron to something else, if that electron is lost, then what is left? No. <laughs> well, just a proton. I'm going with on the board over here. Just a proton. And just a proton means just a positive charge. So I don't want you to get confused like I got confused the first time, the first years I started studying general chemistry. And I didn't understand that there was uh, no difference between a proton and a hydrogen uh, ion, a hydrogen atom that had lost its electron. Be aware of this. Understand hydrogen. Notice how it is abbreviated with an H, with an, with an H. So if I put a plus sign right here, I can call that a hydrogen ion, or I can call it a proton, because that's really all that's left, right? When we take away that electron, all that's left is that positive charge, that proton. This is incredibly important, because this is the basis of the pH scale. And you guys need to know the pH scale. You need to understand what it's about, because you're going to be dealing with it a lot. A change in pH, a small change of pH, can cause things like delirium, Coma, yeah. So you need to understand pH. Well, small change on the, on the uh, in the number system at least. So this of, of these three, this is the one I really want you to understand the most. So I'm going to say it again. We have an atom of hydrogen. An atom of hydrogen is made up of one proton in the nucleus, and that's it in the nucleus. And then it has one electron that is zipping around it. Notice how it looks like a sphere, it looks like a ball. But the reality is what this is showing you is that at any point in time, this electron is not going to be outside of here. Well, it shouldn't be outside of here. But it can be in anywhere within this space. That's why they show this shaded area. Electrons are constantly moving. So at any point, it can be within that space. If that atom of hydrogen gives up that electron, all that's left is a proton. Which is why a hydrogen ion, meaning it's lost a charge, it's lost an electron, and it actually has just a charge, is also called a proton. We'll hear people say things like increased number of proton, proton, one arm, increased number of protons, decreased, is going to decrease the pH, is going to decrease the number, increase the problems. All right, do we see helium has two protons, two neutrons? number and then of course two electrons. What do you know about lithium? Lithium still is rather choice for bipolar disorder. 
a little bit dangerous though. Small therapeutic window. Periodic table. This is actually a nice image of the periodic table elements. Again, uh, the only thing it's lacking is what all of these mean, what the abbreviations mean, what the a letter or letters mean. Top number is the uh, atomic number, the bottom number is the atomic mass. C for carbon, N for nitrogen, nitrogen O for oxygen. oxygen. Uh, what other ones do you want to know here? Is it, oh, we saw that one. Copper. Oh, manganese. Uh, here's an important one. Potassium. Potassium. Sodium above that. Uh, right next to potassium. K for kalemia. Uh, uh, That's how we have the K in it. Uh, CA for calcium. What other one would you need to know? No. AG, do you know AG? Arcan. I'm sorry? Silver. 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 AU. That's a good one to know because you'll hear of um, AU for aureus. And of course, Staphylococcus aureus is the type of bacteria. And one of the things that you see when it when it creates colonies is sort of a yellowish color to it. And in fact, you'll see it in uh, cases of impetigo, undeveloped uh, child space. Although it can also be caused by strep, but imp uh, the impetigo causes the kind of a crusty gold color around their face. It's gross. Okay. Uh, Typical atom, number of positively charged protons equals the uh, number of electrons, hopefully. But if they gain or lose, they're going to change uh, their neutral charge to something else. If, if um, uh, helium, I'm going to look this up there. If an atom loses an electron, that means it loses a negative charge. If it had a perfect balance, positive charges and negative charges. If it loses an electron, if it loses that negative charge, that part of the balance, now we have more positive charges than we have negative charges. So then that atom's going to become positively charged. Does that make sense? You gain an electron, you gain a negative charge. That's where we see those positive and negative signs. They lose two electrons. A positive, positive charge, plus two. We see this with sodium and chloride. And I think, so I think they talked about it just a little bit uh, back there. If the elements are separated through a process of ionization, sodium loses an electron, becoming uh, Na, plus, and chloride gains electron, becoming Cl negative. 